Hi. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. Many letters, many syllables. So, Transfiguration Sunday. And many um, liberal ministers usually struggle to write a meaningful sermon about this event. And it maybe it might be the fact that we're stuck with the same strange, mysterious story year after year of, uh, about the shining Jesus at the top of a mountain. It might be the pressure to deliver one last uplifting sermon before the beginning of Lent. It might be the traditional representation of a very uh, powerful and majestic Christ that does not always fit our theology these days. It might be simply the fact that we lack words to explain um, an unusual experience. Well, one of the challenges to understand uh, this text come from the fact that we do not read the preceding chapters on Transfiguration Sunday. And since I don't want to take uh, two full hours to explain it to you, because uh, long and painful sermons become, begin next week with Lent, uh, let us just say that in the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus uh, argues often with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, one day, representatives of these two groups show up to test Jesus and ask him to provide a sign from heaven. Then the disciples get into uh, weird theological debates about yeast before leaving town with their master, in Caesarea Philippi, uh, Peter affirms with authority that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and he should avoid his upcoming fate in Jerusalem. He's rebuked. And six days after this, Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John, essentially his inner circle, I would say, and together they go to the top of a mountain. And up there, Jesus begins to shine. Moses and Elijah show up, and the voice from heaven says, This is my son, the beloved. With him I'm very pleased. Listen to him. Don't know about you, but I believe this would be difficult to have a better sign from heaven than this. This story link is a link with happened previously with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And for centuries, theological treaties and analysis of all sorts have been written to identify which mountain they climb. How could we explain that Jesus' clothes become dazzling white and, and why Moses and Elijah appeared at Jesus' side and not other prophets or heroes of the First Testament. There had been so many suggestions or interpretation that very often preachers and, and people in the pews or listening to sermons are completely lost. Too often, we lose ourselves in the smallest details we lose sight of the core of the story. As the expression says, we cannot see the forest from the trees. What probably happened is that on an unknown day, in an unknown place, Peter, James, and John had a powerful, mystical, and sacred experience. These men live a moment of profound grace. And for one reason or another, they look at their master and they saw him in a new light. As Bishop John Shelby Spong famously coined, they truly felt that heaven and earth, you know, 
touch each other in the person of Jesus. In him, God and humanity came together. And at that moment, they were in completely, complete awe and the best way they found to describe this unique experience is the image and the words we have in today's text. The disciple had this amazing moment with Jesus at the top of a mountain 2,000 years ago. And, but unfortunately for all of us today, well, Jesus is no longer physically present in our midst. As hard as we wish, the same event cannot be duplicated. However, it does not mean that we cannot live similar experiences in our lives. The absence of Jesus' shining face and dazzling white clothing does not preclude us from engaging sacredness around us. There are many places and times when God still speaks to us, when God is still present, and most often it does not happen at the top of a special mountain or any other places we consider holy. When we are truly attentive, we can perceive the presence of the divine all around us, and sometimes in the most mountain of our activities. It might occur in a living room when we simply play and laugh with a child, when we listen to beautiful music, when we walk barefoot in the sand watching the wave rolling in, or when we're having a beer with a longtime friend. Every once in a while, we experience something special, something so touching, something so incandescent, something so life-giving, something so extraordinary that we have the feeling that everything is glowing around us and time stands still. And for most of us, our first instinct is to try to hold on to those moments of grace. Like the disciple, we want to say, things are great here. Let's, let's hold on to it. Let's stay in this place forever. Let us keep everything as it is. Let's have the same liturgy. Next time, let's repeat exactly the same program year after year. It's like saying, I live a very magical moment many years ago when I got married in this church, so don't you dare changing the color of the walls or moving the communion table or, or saying the United Church of Canada gave me so much during my lifetime, lifetime. Don't you dare messing up with the policies and the structures. For most of us, seeing the possibilities beyond our mountaintop experiences, it's quite a struggle, yes. But our challenge is to remember that this special moment did not change Jesus. It is the disciples who are transformed. When they heard voice from heaven, well, they, they fell to the ground, they were overcome by fear, but Jesus came. Jesus touched them, saying, get up and do not be afraid. The disciples were told to stand on their own feet and to live truly and faithfully in the moment. They, this event taught them a very valuable lesson. Rising up and being unafraid is the way to follow Christ. It was true at the top of the mountain, when they came down to rejoin the rest of the crowd and the people, and as they continue to journey alongside Jesus. You see, those sacred moments we have, they can transform us. They can change our lives. They can influence the way we do ministries outside and outside our churches. They can teach us to 
see beyond appearance and acknowledge the bright inner beauty in every child of God. They can open our minds to unexpected, unsuspected realities. They can help us to identify those who are despised and rejected or ignored by our communities of faith. Just imagine for a second what could be, what would happen if we're accepted to be unafraid, to be touched by the presence of God, both in our personal and collective lives. Just imagine what would be the effect on the world if we accept it, if we dare to communicate with others those special moments, those transformative moments in our lives. Just imagine what could be the repercussion of sharing, sorry, repercussion of sharing this sort of light so all can see them. Every once in a while we can encounter someone, we can read something, we can experience a special moment that is telling us, look, this is what it's all about. Well, after the service today, we had our annual meeting. And the challenge was to remember that we do not balance a budget for the fun of it. We do not maintain two churches building, church buildings just because we love architecture. We have gathered because we are a community of faith. We are disciples of Jesus the Christ. We believe in God. We believe we can make a difference in this community. And regardless of where we feel those special moments, those special experiences, we still believe that what we're doing is meaningful. And that's the point of all of this. Why we gather, why we share, why we worship, why we help one another. That's the core of our faith. And that should be the core of our stories. Thank you for watching. Thanks be to God and Amen.